My name is Monk Rowe, and we're at the 2020 Jazz Education Network Conference in New Orleans. And I'm very privileged to have Peter Erskine with me today. And I went to your, your gig Tuesday night, and it was really awesome. Thank you. We had a good time. Um, we were speaking earlier about the, uh, the joys, perils, and uh, um, uh, some of the amusing incidents uh, that occurred during travel. And uh, you know, I'm sure everyone has a story either getting into New Orleans or, or getting out. Um, but I, I was reminded uh, of a flight from Rome to Tel Aviv quite a few years ago. And we were flying on the Alitalia airline. And we went to a gate, and everything seemed kind of normal. And then I realized this gate was kind of set apart from any other departure gates. And uh, an announcement was made that the, a security check would, it, would take place, so please have our boarding passes and passports. So this guy comes up to me and says, uh, may I see your passport and boarding pass? And, and he looks at it, and why are you traveling to Tel Aviv? And, I'm a musician, I'm going to play a concert. He goes, okay, thanks very much. So I think, well, that was pretty easy. So I'm, uh, I'm listening to some music, just standing there. And out of nowhere, this woman comes from kind of behind me in the side. And she motions, she wants to say something. So I take off my headphones. I say, yes. She said, Mr. Erskine. What kind of band is it that has four musicians who live in New York City and one who lives in Los Angeles? And uh, I couldn't resist. You know, I do a De Niro all of a sudden. I just look at her and smile. I went, that's good. I said, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the kind of band that likes the way I play the drums, I guess. I don't know what else to tell you. She went, okay, thanks. Um, I guess she was looking for the tell. I there see. was no tell to be had. Yes. <laughs> you have to be getting, I mean, you're probably used to uh, people coming up to you and engaging in this kind of thing. And it's almost like, uh, now how am I going to respond to this person? Well, at, at the Gen Conference, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's students or colleagues. And so with the colleagues, it's all, hey, man, you know. And we do a quick assessment of each other, and hey, we're still here, we're, we're survivors. Uh, but mostly students and, and mm -hmm. fans, and, and it's, uh, it's a nice thing. Uh, you know, you might be busy trying to get somewhere, and people stop you, but I think you would feel worse if no one stops you, so. Good point. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the, the concert, even though people watching us weren't there. I'd like to point out a few things that, that I observed and uh, that, first of all, the tunes you played were wonderful. I mean, uh, there was a gospel thing that ran through oh, that much was of the a, gig. That was a song by pianist Alan Pasqua, and he calls that gumbo time. Yeah. And uh, it's a very soulful tune. and. Um, he started it off pretty slowly, I mean, in terms of the tempo. And slow tempos are always uh, fun. You know, I, I like playing slower tempos more than faster tempos. Um, but it does take a little bit of concentration, and it also takes trust. And not only trusting the other musicians, but trusting yourself and trusting the music. Uh, the point being, I guess, you don't need to oversell it. Yeah, I noticed you might have been on that tune, but uh, more than that, there were some really nice fills that you would play going into the next section of music. And you left out something quite often, and that was like what we might expect to be the last note of the fill on beat one of the new section. Mm -hmm. And I was anticipating the bop. 
and the bop wasn't there often. I thought, man, that's that's great because a rest my is world a note. And, my world and welcome to it. <laughs> I'm sorry. When did you I, I learn to, When did you learn that that works? Well, what you're referring to is. Uh, I can remember I would, uh, middle of the fill, I, I would uh, I play the snare drum and the hi-hat, and the hi-hat's open, and it's sustaining and ringing. And the expectation is that then to the psh, boom, 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 you know, that one. Um, and, you know, the one's being played somewhere else, and so the drums don't need to do it. And, and uh, if anything, I think it's it's just an extension of, of the drumming devices uh, pioneered by Kenny Clark, where uh, you know some of the earlier bebop recordings, uh, instead of playing on the downbeat, he would play the accent maybe like on the fourth beat, so you get to the head of the new section, two, three, four, that, boom, and so it just it it creates a, a, a nice overlap. Um, and if you visualize or think of the music in any kind of textural terms, then that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And one of the tunes was yours, right? Two of the tunes. Two of the tunes. But that second tune, I, I didn't get the title of it, and you was dedicated to someone? Uh, yeah, dedicated to the late Don Grolnick. And uh, I call it Uncle Don, because um, I just remember that was a, a nickname that I think Will Lee and I had for Don. We'd call him Uncle Don. Uh, and Don had written a tune that uh, we used to play in, in Steps, which later became known as Steps Ahead, a tune called Uncle Bob, which was one of the uh, uh, songs we would always you know, play during our set. So it, I just wanted to make a tribute to him. I was thinking of it. Beautiful. Thanks. Um, where do you write your tunes? Do you sit at the piano? At the piano. Um, when I was younger and the whole MIDI thing was just starting to come together, I, I relied on that to do all my composing. Um, and I got pretty good at, at utilizing sounds and, and the, the sequencing capabilities of of the computer you know, using a Macintosh. Um, uh, as that got more and more sophisticated, I found myself kind of pulling away from it oddly. Um, and it was partly, uh, uh, I, you know, my being unfamiliar with I mean, these leaps and jumps and, and, and the technology, but also uh, just becoming more aware of uh, the eraser on the pencil, and and how much more fun it was to kind of manually work these things out. Um, you know, uh, both of the tunes we played. Well, 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 we just look at Uncle Don. I mean, it's it's a it's a fairly simple song. A couple of the hip chords were not a function of, oh, I'll play a F flatted whatever. You know, whatever. Um, I'm just sitting at the piano and then finding a voicing. I went, oh, that sounds cool. And then writing it down. Um, Joe Zoffinel gave me some really good advice uh, back in, in 1986. I played him some music that I'd uh, composed. It was f the first theatrical production I got to score. Is, is Shakespeare? Uh, it was Shakespeare, Richard yeah. II. And Joe listened to it, and uh, I was so used to Joe offering, you know, deprecating or denigrating comments. I was quite pleased when he said, "He said, yeah, he said, you write in the Viennese tradition," and and I was quite pleased. He said, uh, "He said, let me give you one suggestion." He, uh, he said, "I can I can hear some harmonic patterns because you're comfortable in that key." He said, "Try writing." in keys you're not comfortable in. He said, sit down at the keyboard and start playing in G flat. And he said, if nothing else, you're going to get lucky because you're, you're just going to 
play something that you know you didn't intend and so that's what happens you know I'm, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable I, I was spending time last night at uh, Chuck Shares booth He's, he publishes many wonderful books and I was going to get another one just about basic harmony because I'm not a proficient keyboard player at all but I do own a piano well after that concert I was thinking to myself um, if you keep applying yourself, you might be able to make a career as a musician. I hope so. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> Still I learning. Just, I just uh, had to get that in there. Well, that's a point well made and taken. I mean, the reason I'm staying for the length of the conference is because I'm going to all these presentations. I learned a lot of great things and and. Um, you know, I was taking out my, my iPhone, and, and I wasn't checking mail, but I was uh, making notes in, uh, mm. in my notepad, and I'll transcribe those later. Mm. I've always been a bit of a note taker, and when I wrote that semi-autobiography and kind of chronicle of weather report, my book, No Beethoven, um, you know, a, a lot of the source material, which I just found in, in uh, I didn't keep diaries, but I kept my my date books, mm -hmm. and um, if someone said something funny or interesting, I, I, I would yes. jot it down at the yeah. end of the day. And then you knew when and where, too, if it was in your date For the book. most part. I mean, memory does play tricks, yeah. and I tried to be as accurate as I could, um, but there's always a possibility of... Well, I, I wonder if you have a memory of this. Um, and this was a comment this actually from a, one of those jazz on CD books, which probably came out in the late 90s, but the uh, person was talking about Birthday in Britain, 1973, uh, Kenton LP. And his comment was, this 19-piece band is mostly filled with forgotten youngsters, except for Willie Maiden and Dick Shearer and the then unknown drummer Peter Erskine. So you've come a long way. The Kenton Band was a, was a great school. It was a, a great doorway um, into playing. And um, I mean, I haven't forgotten uh -huh. any of the other youngsters that, that were in the band. Um, but you were 18, is that right? I was 18, and, you know, yeah. What did you learn from guys like Willie Maiden and the older musicians? You know, the fun thing is to, uh, I think we all do it, is, is uh, boy, if I could go back and if I knew then what I know now. Um, a lot of the uh, learning was, uh, you know, trial and error. And when you're young, you, you say dumb things, you play dumb things. Um, but always well-intentioned. Uh, you know, you're just... You've got a job to do all of a sudden, and you're trying to, to, to do your best. And, and, and being a drummer in a big band, you have to satisfy a certain number of requirements. Uh, you know, Stan wanted things a certain way. The trombone section wanted things a certain way. The trumpet players wanted things a certain way. The legacy or tradition of the music demanded things be a certain way, and it would be easy to violate any one of those at any given point. Your ego has its own demands as well. So that's what growing older does. You just figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, but I can listen to, to some of that, and, you know, smile at it or cringe on occasion. But uh, the, the, the writing for the band was, was great. I mean, Stan commanded uh, much love and, and respect from his team of writers, Willie Maiden being among them. Um, Willie was uh, a funny guy. Uh, uh, you know, I was a fan of his from the work he'd done with Maynard Ferguson. And I loved his writing. He did something interesting. We were speaking about writing earlier. Uh, he wrote his arrangements on the bus while we would be driving from one place to another, and these were often long bus rides. 
And I think most writers will treat the score paper um, vertically. You know, they, they write something and they'll, they'll voice it out. Willie would start with the first alto part and write it all the way from the beginning to the end. And then he would add the tenor, or the second alto, fourth tenor, and baritone saying. I mean, he'd flesh out the, uh, the chart. And, you know, he said, I have it all up here. It's already written. I just, I'm just getting it down on paper. Like Mozart. Yeah. Yeah, he was pretty remarkable. They came to, um, the band came to the school I was at, SUNY Fredonia. But it was, I think it was just shortly before you joined. I think John Von Olin might have Because we did a residency in Fredonia. Yeah, it probably was after I was I there. I think that was in, s lit, like, late 72 or... Or yeah, it was, I thought it was right before we'd gone to Europe, so mm -hmm. that was okay. Yeah, but Willie was on the band, and he yeah he was he was a character. He was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, I didn't learn it. I mean, how do you learn from something? You know, someone says, "If it's good for you, it's bad for you." I mean, that was one. <laughs> that's one of the things he used to say. Um, he loved the color orange. He hated the color green. He wouldn't eat green vegetables. He hated McDonald's. At one point, um, it was in the, the fall of 72 when uh, Stan was in the hospital recovering from an aneurysm. Um, and that was a, a tough time for the band. It was difficult. You know. um, one of the gigs was a private birthday party for Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. And um, this was a gig in Chicago, I think, at the Hilton Hotel, one of the older hotels. And they had asked for the band to play an arrangement of Happy Birthday. And so Willie was tasked with writing an arrangement of Happy Birthday. And so he writes it. And it was an amazing chart. I mean, we were like floored. We, we ran it down before the gig, played it. R Willie hated McDonald's. So the gig was over. People were leaving the ballroom. Willie went around the bandstand just as we're beginning to pack up, and he collected each part that he had handwritten. And he set them in the middle of the band set up, set it on fire, <laughs> and he burned the chart. And he said, I hate McDonald's. No one's ever going to hear this again. That's serious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was. Wow, great story. Is it, was it hard to leave? He went from Kenton to uh, Maynard Ferguson, right? With a uh, one-year... Uh, Interruption. I, I, I left the road and decided to go back to school because I, I had dropped out of college to join the Kenton Band. And uh, it was uh, an essential year of study and reflection and just trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, I was in the odd position of, of, of being the, the one student in our percussion department. Uh, George Gaber was the instructor. This was at Indiana University. Um, and I was the one student who had left the gig to come back to school, more or less. And everyone else was just, you know, couldn't wait to get out of school to get, get the gig. And, and Gaber was quite understanding of this. And he was very patient with me, very helpful. And the thing that we worked on the most, and it took time, I mean, as in years later, for me to finally kind of connect all the dots. But it, it all had to do with touch and tone. And uh, the Kenton band was, was a loud band, and I, w I had become a, a heavy hitter. And this concerned Professor Gaber. And I remember one lesson um, 
he stopped what we were doing. We were sight reading or doing something, I think, on the snare drum. And he, uh, he handed me a triangle beater, and he pointed to a triangle. He said, all right, mezzo piano, you get one chance. So I went over, played it. He took a puff on the cigar, and he went, that was too loud. I'll get out. And that was my lesson. So I started practicing whole notes just to see how softly and how consistently can I play. But it, it took a long time to develop that sense of touch that he was alerting me to. Wow. Well, I was watching a video of the Kenton Band, and I can imagine that it would be difficult to not play loud. Yeah, it was loud. Maynard's band was loud. Um, and I had turned it down, I think, three times when he called, you know, because I wanted to finish school. And, and uh, uh, fans will forgive me for saying this, but I, I, I used to view Maynard's band as a bit of a three ring circus, you know, it's just. In his being generous and highlighting the side men, it just seemed like more of a show. I, I somehow had this idea that music should somehow be a little more purely presented. That being said, Maynard was the best boss I ever had. And a wonderful guy. And I really enjoyed the band. And it did prepare me for the Weather Report gig. And in fact, I got the gig because Jocko heard me playing with Maynard. Yeah. Um, but that was also a loud band. I mean, my original weather report inspiration or vision, you know, was was hearing the way Alphonse Rouzan and Eric Cravat played, and small little four-piece kids, and they weren't. It was intense, but they weren't hitting really hard. By the time I joined Weather Report, I mean the the volume on the stage was was loud, and they wanted that kind of power, mm -hmm. and because I. Had I had done these big band gigs, you know, I could deliver on that. I was in good shape and, and could function at that dynamic level. Um, it, it, again, that, that took some time to, to unlearn or to, you know, to, to get around to learning how to play soft. And, um, I mean, it was it was fun. It was it, we were we were fast and fearless. Did you get to the point? When did you get to the point where the money offered to you was an issue? Because usually a young musician say, "Yeah, I'll come on the band," <laughs> and doesn't have the nerve to say, "125 twenty five a week." No, man, I can't. Well, the, the the Kenton band. I'd 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 been with Stan for about four days or so into the tour, and and found myself sharing the elevator with him. The the the, the club was in the basement of the hotel, and so we're going up to our respective floors. And he looked at me and he goes, "No, I I had first met Stan when I was seven years old at, at one of the national stage band camps, so I felt like I knew him. Anyway, and." Uh, he, uh, he goes, Peter, he goes, you know, we haven't discussed money yet. So I said, okay, how much do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was good for an extra 25 or $50 a week. Um, the, the, no, the pay wasn't great, and it wasn't great on management, but I managed to, to save up quite a bit of money because, you know, when you're 18, what do you spend your money on? Nothing. Not, mean, that not, good, not that good stuff that's bad for you? <laughs> no, you know, I, I mean, uh, and things were fairly inexpensive back then, you know. And we even had to pay for, uh, pay part of the hotel bills. But um, I was sending all my money home t to my dad, and, and uh, by the time I got off the road, I saved up, you know, enough money to buy a car and then, go back to school. Your parents um, 
must have been cool with your choice of career. You started hitting oh, the were, drums at four. They were more four. than cool. They were completely encouraging. My father was a psychiatrist, but before that he'd been a jazz bass player. And I was the one out of four children who, who seemed to take to music, uh, you know, instantly. Um, so I received uh, a disproportionate amount of, I think, his attention and, and interest and support because, you know, he got to live a lot of that again through me, I think. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my siblings were also very encouraging about my playing. Um, so I was very fortunate. Um, the timing of, of, of growing up, you know, beginning to play the drums in the late 1950s, early 1960s, I mean, the music was just exploding, just with change, and, and um, we had the, we had these national stage band camps. You notice they weren't called jazz camps, because jazz was still a dirty word in those days. You had lab bands, you had stage bands, you had studio orchestras. Um, that was the name of the jazz uh, big band at the Interlochen Arts Academy, where I went to high school. Um, you know, schools didn't use the word jazz. It, it, it took a few years for that to become acceptable. It's, it's kind of hard to believe now, but... It is. It is. Don Benza talked yeah. about that in, at SUNY Fredonia. That you know, no jazz in the practice rooms. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something wild. One of the servicemen told me that um, on the rare occasions now when the White House requests a jazz group, they have written, I don't know if you call them instructions or orders, no improvising. These people just want to hear like kind of cocktail music, but they don't want to hear any. Probably we just want to hear the song. Well, this is the current administration. Yep. And as small a detail as that may seem to be in the grand scheme of things, I think it's probably one of the more telling yeah. aspects of, of of what a deficit of. Um, of all the things that make us human, hmm. empathy, intellectual curiosity, freedom of expression, compassion, you know, and uh, sorry to get political, but it's, you know, it's beyond Alice in Wonderland at this point. We have a, uh, a person in charge of the country with, with a glaringly obvious uh, mental deficit. Um, and so I believe it was Cicero, you know, who profits, who gains? So you try to look at it, all right, why is this charade, this horribly destructive charade being allowed to continue? Um, you know, money and power are always the, the first elements you, you would look at, but it's, it's beyond my comprehension. And I was, uh, Hoping to start off the year hopeful, and uh, my good friend Jack Fletcher, who was the director that invited me to write f for one of his plays years ago, he said, that's not hope. He said, you're exhausted. He said, you're setting down a baton. You're in a relay and you don't even want to carry it forward. He said, just get some rest. And, uh, yeah, I think he has a point. The people in uh, the circles that I, musicians travel in, I think, would agree with what you're saying. But the, maybe that's a wrong assumption on my part. You'd be surprised at some of the right-wingers who improvise. <laughs> <laughs> it blows my mind when I run into these. Well, it's one who's very close to me. And so we just, we don't discuss politics. Yeah, leave him at the door. 
or if we do, he just gets very quiet now. He's, um, yeah, well, let's not go there. Let's okay. Not. We may come back to that, though. Okay. I, I think it's important to know what, that beyond the music, what people like yourself think, actually. So. Well, I mean, your, uh, your beautiful uh, videotaped interview with Dave and Iola, you know, when Dave talks about, you know, like the whole room came together, and, 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 and the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, and where he points out, okay, circle, what's the first thing that they try to suppress? Mm. Jazz. The story I just told about the White House, Boom. Bingo. Okay. Um, there are a number of, of uh, educators, because we're here at the Jazz Education Network. Uh, one I'll give a shout out to is Ed Sof, who continues to be uh, 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 a loud and uh, poking the stick in the eye of the bear. Uh, uh, voice uh, about what's right and, 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 and what's not right. Um, and, you know, with, with social media, I, um, I've been kind of going back and forth again It's part of that exhaustion. I just, I don't know if I want to be too much a part of this platform that, that spreads so much disinformation. And yet, you know, we can look to that Bernstein quote about, you know, our job is not to solve the problems, but we have to provide the art to inspire maybe ourselves, but certainly other people who can directly maybe influence or solve these problems. But we might be coming to a point in this country where it's just every individual has to get involved, mm -hmm. has to stand up. Certainly the vote is part of it, unless that's been rigged beyond measure. That's hard to say. I hope not. Okay. I'm going to start drinking momentarily here. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a milk and bourbon punch at the bourbon house. A friend recommended it. It's kind of like a milkshake oh. with bourbon. Maybe we'll go there next. <laughs> um, no, the, I, I'm going to jump back into... Um, I'm still a little fuzzy. You mentioned, uh, I think you were talking about Kenton and you trying to please the trombones and, the, and Kenton himself and your own ego. When you got into Weather Report, where did your ego fit in between Joe and, and Jocko? <laughs> wow. There wasn't a whole lot of air for it. Um, I instinctively just kind of stood back a little and observed. I was, you know, playing wise, I was pretty fearless and, and Joe liked that. Um, okay, okay, a couple things. I'll just go back, you know. The, the main fault or lack of understanding that I had, I think, when I was playing in the Kenton Big Band was I didn't realize how tough of a job those brass players had. And you know, it's just a physically demanding and exhausting uh, book to play. And, you know, they're standing there and they're counting and they have to prepare to come in, take a breath, get the, you know, embouchure all set, and then the drummer pulls the rug out from under them. It's, you know, I mean, I remember one time I turned around and the trumpet player uh, motioning he was going to throw his harmon mute at, at my head. <laughs> <laughs> but Stan used to come up to me and say, he said, Peter, pardon the language, he said, I want you to fuck them up. They're getting lazy back there, so play some shit. So he would encourage me to, and, you know, I was, uh, I, I, you know, I wanted to think that Stan hired me, uh, well, not for my good looks, but maybe for my, my drumming. But I was also a poster child for what he was doing. He was taking jazz to schools. Yeah. Here's this 18-year-old kid with long hair. Um, so I kind of plugged in perfectly to his agenda. Uh, so much so that when I cut my hair, because I wanted to be more like the older guys, he got upset 
and I, I grew it back. <laughs> That's an inside story right there. There you go. Yeah. Now, um, but Joe, Joe and Wayne were intrigued by the idea that I had played with Kenton. Now, they had both played with Maynard's band way back in the, in the start of both of their careers. Um, and, you know, they, they, they both had good things to say or good feelings about Maynard. But it was the Kenton band that intrigued them. Now, had they heard me with the Kenton band, I think they never would have even let me in the front door. But they were thinking of, like, the Kenton band in the 50s and how experimental it was and, he, and that, wow here's a drummer that can actually Jocko says he can play the R&B stuff and he knows how to how to guide a, a, a large ensemble so a jazz writer in Japan had either the insight or the temerity to ask my first question at the press conference I haven't played a note in concert yet with the band we just rehearsed briefly um, you know, um, I'm just sitting there and they're talking. So the uh, journalist says, uh, I have a question for Peter Erskine. You've played in the big bands of Stan Kenton and Maynard Ferguson. How does this qualify you to play for Weather Report? And I was a bit taken aback and um, I, I start to give this sort of, uh, well, you know, good music is good music and at that point Zavonov interrupts me and he goes just kind of motions for me to shut up and he he speaks into his microphone he goes weather report is a big band and we're a small group too or weather report is a small group and we're a big band too next question um and uh, interestingly enough i mean joe started you know we, we even played uh, rockin and rhythm the ellington tune that became part of the band's repertoire um so Joe, yeah, Joe was was kind of going back to his roots, and I at least had not only that jazz connection, but um, I found this uh, uh, new level of esteem when um, Jocko chanced upon me, and I, th I think he may have gotten Joe and Wayne, and I was backstage and I wasn't aware, um, and I was playing a, a little bit of Bach on the piano, and, and that impressed them. Oh, nice. But otherwise, uh, to try to compete with, with with Joe or Jocko was tough. I mean, I, I have a microphone on my chest, so I, I dare not uh, thump it. But they were real chest thumpers. And literally, they would, hey, man, you know, uh, thump their chest. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, an okay. anthropologist or, or somebody with that kind of understanding would have a field day with these guys. Wow. I'm surprised then that it held together as long as it did the, with that four. Well, Wayne was always kind of the yin to, to Joe's yang, mm. I think. Um, Adam Nussbaum said something yesterday. He said, you know, you, you can't have the fire without the air. You know, or, or maybe that was Matt Wilson. I forget. Matt Wilson gave a great class yesterday. But yeah, the, it's all about balance. And, and Wayne provided that balance. And, and even when people were beginning to complain that, that Wayne wasn't being heard enough, I think that was his instinctive or conscious attempt at balance oh. somehow. When did um, Birdland move from st like straight eighth notes into this nasty shuffle. That's me. Well, when I first joined the band, I was playing it, you know, similarly to the way Alex did. Uh, and and I, just for the record, when I heard that for the first time, it was, just, it was such a magical sounding recording. And I told Jocko, I said, this is the version of Weather Report I've been waiting for. And I was fine, like, just let it be Alex, Manolo, Joe Wayne and Jocko for the rest of time. I would have been happy. Uh, but things change. And, um, and so I, I got invited into the band and then, and then Joe at one point just said, you know, stop playing that bossa nova beat. I don't want to hear that. 
Can you do something else? Well, what about this? And um, it, for some reason, I found I found that it, instead of just playing a four on the floor like a jazz shuffle, you know, boom, 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 tick, ding, ding. I, I did the but quite a bit faster. Um, it was a bit of a workout. Um, but it, it, it kind of worked. It so did work out. <laughs> well, th yeah, the, that whole band was a workout, that whole experience. So we're touring. I talk about this in, in my book. Uh, after Birdland, there'd be two or three more tunes. It was kind of, you know, there were built in encores and stuff. And we get to the last tune. Uh, it was a medley of, of two compositions of Joe's, Badia and Boogie Woogie Waltz. And it goes into this very fast double time. One, two, three, you know, kind of. And uh, because, you know, I was 24, 25, Jocko was 26 or 27. I mean, we were, we were basically about half the age of, of John Wayne. And so we're playing this fast and rather furious thing. And then Jocko would kind of walk over and we'd both look at Joe and we'd start going <laughs> you know, just another you know tune um, but on this one tour of Europe the lighting rig was was designed it was just lower than it had been and when they would turn on all these lights it got really hot on stage and 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 playing outdoors and it's hot and these lights and, and I'm running out of steam and so I I asked Joe or suggested to Joe hey as we're playing this can I kind of give you the the look or the high sign so we can play the last cycle I can go you know on afterburners and end it at maximum strength you know for the sake of the tune as well as my own Survival. Survival. And Joe just looks at me like, oh yeah? So I, sh I should have been prepared. That night we play it and I give him the look. And I'm like, all right. And he just looks at me and he turns and digs in and all of a sudden his keyboards get substantially louder. And he keeps playing. So now we have to do another whole long cycle. So I've, I'm betrayed and I'm really annoyed. And so now I'm, I'm cursing. Father, son of a... I just can't believe it. I'm, I'm like flipped. And so he's had his fun. He looks around and rather triumphantly, okay, now we finish, you know, I'm the band leader. And, you know, you can't try to lead the band if you got a band leader. And I should have remembered that because Maynard had taught me that, you know. There can only be one band leader. Anyway, we end the tune, the lights go black, we're supposed to clear the stage, it's just the way this, the show went. And uh, I was so angry, I just started pounding the snare drum, at first kind of incoherently. And I'm just, you son of a bat. But pretty quickly I'm realizing, it just sounds like Eric Gravatt all of a sudden, what's going on? I mean, this was, you know, I, I was a big band drummer. I played by the rules, pretty much. And uh, so I'm banging away playing this thing. And I sense a presence. From, and I have no idea how I'm going to end this thing. I'm just, there I am on stage by myself. And I, I look up and open my eyes. And somehow Joe has climbed up and he's balanced somewhat precariously on the edge of this drum riser. And he's right in front of me. And I, I, my first thought is he's gonna, he's gonna punch me in the nose. But instead he has this look of ecstasy. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. 
And he jumps off, you know, pumps his fist up in the air, jumps off the riser. So I finish it. And uh, he comes up and thanks me. He just said, thank you, man. And I'm like, for what? To myself, I didn't understand. So the next day, the manager comes up to me. I was kind of half expecting this. He says, Joe would like to speak with you. Uh, okay, here we go. I have to make it a little emotional when I tell this. But um, you know, the man manager said, Joe wants to see you. So I go to the dressing room, and there's the whole crew and band. And I'm handed a, uh, there's a plastic cup, you know, for the dressing room drinks. And I'm handed a cup of cognac. And everyone's there. And Joe just announces, he says, he goes, everyone. Last night, Peter graduated. <laughs> Thank you for telling us that. That's, that's like the best uh, way to have one over the band, I guess. The technique of, you know, terrific drummers, that's, that's one thing, but the imagination that it takes to do something original or the perfect thing at the right moment or something innovative. Imagination. Can you teach imagination to your students beyond technique? As long as there is intellectual curiosity, I think you can teach most anything. It's teaching an awareness of the choices that are available. Um, it's teaching them, if they haven't done so already, to think and be aware much more about melody and the function of harmony and um, the way that other instrumentalists phrase or the way the vocalists sing. Um, You know, a, a lot of what we do, and we, you know, my job number one is to, is to provide rhythmic information to the band, and then you try to do it as elegantly as as possible to serve the music. You know, so eventually you you learn to strip away the things that would call attention to yourself. Uh, it's not surrendering the element of control that all drummers like to have. In fact, it makes you a much more effective puppeteer, as it were. I can really pull the strings of the music by playing less. And, and um, I'll answer and, and, and regrettably close this interview because I have a, a, okay. a, another one scheduled. Um, there's a film called uh, Shadows and Light. It's a documentary about cinema, uh, particularly about uh, DPs, the directors of photography, who uh, often have much to do with the lighting as well as the positioning of the camera and the movement of it. And they interview the uh, cinematographer who worked on Rosemary's Baby. The director was Roman Polanski. And he's describing a scene where uh, we look down the hallway and there's an opening to the bedroom and the character that Mia Farrow is portraying is sitting on the phone uh, speaking to someone. And so with the, with the stand-in, the you know, woman's there holding the phone, they set up the shot, they frame it a certain way, and they bring Polanski over to look. And he looks, he goes, no, no, no. I want it so that we only see the phone receiver on her ear and the back of her head, nothing forward. We don't, we only see that much of her. So the DP says, I disagreed, but he's the director. So we set it up that way and we shot it. And then he continued, he said, the most incredible thing happened at the premiere. He's in New York. When that scene comes up on the screen, he said the entire audience tried to look around the door instinctively. So what was left 
unseen, or in our case, what's left unplayed, invites a tremendous leveraging of, of involvement or input by the audience. So a, a more prosaic example maybe would be James Brown, Mother Popcorn. So they don't emphasize the downbeat as listeners or dancers. I mean, you, you got to move your booty to fill it. So we're sort of circling back to how you started our conversation about my not playing the downbeat. Because if that allows you, the listener, to supply that, then you're involved with this whole building block thing. And that's why the listening experience becomes, I think, evocative. It, 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 it's because you're inviting the audience in. If you know, you're just playing a bunch of stuff, then you're just it's just like watching a a, a, a film that has, you know, one colossal action scene after another. After a while you're just Yeah. But you know, what did Hitchcock do? Well said. I'm gonna read a quote from you to wrap up. Okay. Right, right along this line. The whole thing about a big band is ultimately the power, the trick to releasing it is the discretion of when to do so, how much patience you want to have before you unleash that kinetic power. If it's full tilt all the time, nobody wins. I said that? You said that. Not bad. It's a good one. Um, Matt Wilson, uh, I think it was on either Twitter or Facebook, it might have been Twitter, uh, uh, an observation about Mel Lewis, that he didn't propel the band, he provided a cushion for it. Um, Mel was also one of the masters of, I mean, everything he played seemed perfect, uh, but he was a master of playing the holes, you know, um, and playing where the band didn't play. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a on a limb here just because we're honoring Dave Brubeck, um, who's one of the genuinely nicest and compassionate people I've ever had the chance to to meet. I didn't get to know him that well, but as you know, as his children were going to interlock and he came and, he, and we got to play with him. Got to play one tune with him. It was real thrill. Uh, but Take five. Um, the best part of that solo that Joe Morello played in the studio that day was the space. I saw later films when you know the tune had become a hit, and I sensed, you know, as a like a drummer, you just sense, okay, Joe kind of feels compelled now to deliver on the drum goods, and it, you know technically brilliant, that's great, but completely not interesting. But that solo with the space and how that, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it reverently kind of displays his affection uh, uh, for Max Roach and the influence that Max Roach had. Um, but how that influenced so many of us. Um, I could play a recording. I was nine years old uh, with the Kenton band at one of these stage band camps. And Stan surprised me. At the end. He said, he said, Peter, play a solo. And it's right out of the Morello solo. When I hear it, still to this day, I'm like, wow, I guess the acorn does grow into the tree. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's thanks to that original impulse that that Morello had. Wonderful. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it very much. It.